What is it like to come face to face with evil? To confront your worst nightmare? When a killer comes calling, there's often no escape. A man who can kill is evil beyond belief. To truly encounter evil is a rarity most will never experience. I believe in evil, uh, and I have experienced people that are evil. But for those unfortunate few who do and survive to tell the tale, the mental scars often never heal. I couldn't breathe. I was, my eyes felt bulging. All I could see was his face on my face, and he was just staring into my eyes. We meet the men and women whose lives have been forever altered by their brush with the beasts who live among us. This is Encounters with Evil. In tonight's program, killers in the family, the men who abuse, murder, and massacre their loved ones, all behind closed doors. The majority of family annihilation cases involve spontaneous killing or murder that's been brought about by an emotional reaction to some situation. So feeling that our lover is going to leave us, feeling that our children are going to be taken away from us, and that incenses the individual who's losing those individuals and makes them react in a fundamentally destructive and nihilistic way. Coming up, the twisted mind of Mitchell Kwai, the wife killer who span a web of lies to play the role of abandoned husband, father, and family man. I've been publicly branded I might as well have murderer wrote across my forehead. Pedophile Stuart Hazel, whose fatal obsession with his partner's granddaughter leads to her death. Did you do anything to say, well, no, I bloody didn't. Excuse my language, but no, I didn't. But first, the infamous case of the White House Farm murder, the story of Jeremy Bamba. It was one of the most sensational murder cases of the decade. Up to that time, I'd never seen anything as horrific as that in terms of uh, cold, calculated, callous uh, murders. Five bodies in a farmhouse in the middle of Tolshunt Darty in Essex, in what can only be described as one of the most gruesome crime scenes in living memory. Bamba's family were living at White House Farm. His mother and father lived there all the time, and on the weekend of the killing, his sister, who was known as Bambi, had brought her two children to visit. Essentially, in one evening, three generations of a family were destroyed. At 24 years old, public school-educated Jeremy Bamber is accused of murdering his mother, father, sister, and his two nephews in a near-perfectly planned crime. As he arrived at the court, Jeremy Bamber looked relaxed and smiled obligingly for the cameras. In court, standing between two policemen, he listened as the clerk read out the charges. That on Tuesday, August the 6th, he murdered Mr. Neville Bamber, Mrs. June Bamber, Sheila Caffell, and Nicholas and Daniel Bamber Caffell. Police found the bodies of three adults and two six-year-old boys dead from shotgun wounds in the family's farmhouse. First police statements said it seemed that Sheila Caffell had killed the family in a fit of depression, then turned the gun on herself. Jeremy was the only member of the Bamba family who survived. Would he shed some light on what might have happened that horrific night? On the night of the killings, Bamba suggested that he'd been at the White House farm, he'd been with his parents and his sister, and there'd been a real argument. And the argument was that his sister was being told by her parents that she wasn't a fit mother and that the two children, the twins that she had, should have been put in care. According to Bamba, he later returns to his home in the village and is woken in the middle of the night. He had a phone call from his father at three o'clock in the morning. 
and it's said, she or Sheila's got the gun, she's gone crazy. And then he said the lion went dead. Just before half past three in the morning of the 7th of August, 1985, Jeremy Bamber called the police. What he does is firstly ring his girlfriend, delaying, possibly delaying in a situation which could cause the deaths of his family. He then looks up in the local pages the number of the local police station. For many criminologists, Bamba's delayed call to local police is a red flag, an unexplained lack of urgency to dial 999 that could indicate his guilt. When the police arrive, Bamber's also arriving, but his behavior, in my opinion, is quite strange. You know, he's trying to put pictures in place, give them stories, reasons behind. It's like he's doing the detective work for them. And it shows that all the way through this, he's trying to ensure that they're forming a picture of his sister that's consistent with the possibility that she has indeed killed her family. Jeremy described um, to the police that Sheila was a nutter. I think this is when the police were outside the house. But he also, I, I believe he said that there was an armory of guns in the house and Sheila was capable of using any of them. His sister had mental health issues, therefore it was nicely packaged. A schizophrenic woman with huge problems has gone on the rampage and murdered the family. The very, very confident brother has managed to explore this and explain it and piece together the pieces. It's very simple, case closed. I entered the house via the kitchen door. The door was off its hinges. So Neville Bamba, these horrific injuries. He's in such a state, he must have put up a horrendous fight, and whoever fought with him uh, must have acted like an animal. And they went upstairs. Sheila was lying on the floor with a gun across the chest and a bowl beside her. Neville obviously put up the greatest degree of struggle, and in fact, seven bullets were pumped into him. Sheila, she had two wounds, which were to the neck. It clearly was the case that she hadn't struggled and indeed had all the indications that she was just put into that position and then, and then was shot twice. At the time, police believed Bamba's story. They treated the scene of the crime very much as a homicide followed by a suicide, in which case you're not protecting evidence because you're not looking for it. You see the, the, the four dead bodies and then the killer, and that's all you need. Just a few hours after police discovered the brutal family murder, Bamber goes back to his home. He'd just eaten a big breakfast. In fact, I was asking anybody else if they'd like breakfast. He didn't appear. Everything was quite strange around him. It just didn't seem normal. I couldn't understand how somebody just lost all his family could suddenly have a fly up. He appeared to be happy. Just doesn't, nothing, there's nothing to happen. I found it very strange. Traumatic grief is very, very difficult, but you'd expect certain things, denial, disbelief, shock, anger. You'd expect him to be really going through these emotions, and he doesn't. The only time he's emotional is when he needs to be. It suggests that the only person that he's thinking of right there and then is himself. After the slaughter of his family, Jeremy's strange behavior was noticed by his cousins. He looked different. He looked dark. His hair was dark. His skin looked darker. and. I'm just saying, he looked different. And his eyes, that his pupils were black, dilated. He wasn't emotional. There's a strong feeling of jealousy and, and unfairness in the fact that his sister had got a flat bought for her and that she was being supported while, while she couldn't work and look after the children. Um, and I think he, I think something probably snapped. At the time of the murders, Bamber was just a worker on his parents' farm and living beyond his means. His lifestyle is a bit of a, a man about time. He's a good-looking man. He likes um, the ladies. You can't do that on a farm labourer's wages. Were there indications in Bamber's childhood he could be capable of such calculated and ruthless murders? 
Wealthy farmers, Neville and June Bamber, adopted Jeremy and he then went to live in a wealthy farm setup. His older sister was also adopted. We're not sure why, other than possibly jealousy. They didn't seem to get on. Bamba's parents gave their kids a loving home and a privileged lifestyle. Both children had an exclusive boarding school education. But life in public school was hard for Jeremy. He loathed being sent away. He rebelled and I think harbored a deep resentment to his adopted parents. He wanted to take some revenge upon them. Obviously, as a child, being adopted can cause a lot of questions. Why were you rejected? What was it about you that your parents didn't want? And then being sent to boarding school can compound that feeling because that you're being rejected again, in your opinion. You're not seeing it that you're there to do well in education. You're being given an opportunity. You see it as another abandonment. Add to that the fact that you've been bullied by your peers, again, a further rejection. All of these, of course, have an impact on the psyche. Bamba also had issues with his adoptive father. He always resented Neville Bamba, who was a rather authoritarian, ex-RAF, rather grand, bullying, if you like. And he'd always hated his treatment. Bamba also resented his sister, Sheila, who was living in the flat in London paid for by their parents. I think he thought they weren't giving him enough. I think he saw how Sheila was living and how he was having to work for a living. And um, I don't think he liked it. I think he resented his sister quite a bit. I would say Jeremy was a Jekyll and Hyde character. He'd come bounding up into the office sometimes, be very pleasant. You couldn't. You really couldn't help but like him. But there was the side to him. His face would change, and you'd see in his eyes that there was another side to him when he was being unpleasant. He was very... He liked to torment people, really. I think he got great pleasure out of seeing people upset. Barbara Wilson, who worked at the farm, believes that Neville Bamber predicted his death at the hands of Jeremy. I'd noted Mr Bamber, he was very deep in himself. He looked ill. This particular Friday, he sat at his desk. And Jeremy had been in previously, and things had, words had been said. And when he, when Jeremy went, Mr. Bamber said, "Oh dear, I think, quite frankly, I shall, I shan't live past the winter." And he said, "I think I shall probably have an accident." I know that Mr. Bamber knew in his heart that it would be Jeremy that killed him. Bamba's cousins felt frustrated with the police inquiries and decided to investigate the death of their relatives themselves. I did feel that the police were pressurising me to accept it as a suicide, but I didn't believe it. I knew something was wrong. They didn't know what they were looking for, but what they find becomes a key piece of evidence in the case. A gun silencer is hidden in one of the cupboards. Bamba's cousins by marriage uh, were never convinced by his explanation and searched the house and discovered a silencer for the rifle, and which was found to have a minute speck of blood in it. We were frightened. We were frightened to tell anybody else what we found. We were frightened. We were frightened for our own safety, really. Um, because if Jeremy could do that so easily to his immediate family, um, look what he could do to us. The silencer is examined, and it quickly becomes apparent that Sheila wouldn't have been able to kill herself with it. Her arms were too short to pull the trigger with the silencer attached. If 
Sheila had used the silencer, which the blood was found, she couldn't, she wasn't tall enough to have been able to stretch down to pull the trigger to kill herself as she was found. Jeremy Bamber's cousin, David Bowflower, described how he found the bloodstained silencer in the gun cupboard at the farm several days after the murders. He handed it in to the police. We have uh, a scene of a crime which has been very cunningly arranged because he was a cunning man and we visited the scene and a judgment was made. Now, the officers misdirected themselves. I'm prepared to admit that, but I see no reason to, uh, to apportion blame. Crucially, evidence from Bamba's ex-girlfriend undermined the story Bamba had been telling. I began to think that Jeremy not only had planned these things, but he'd also carried them out himself. And I became increasingly upset and nervous about things. And that's when I began to realise, really, and I started quizzing him a lot about everything. He told me I ought to be careful and not discuss things in the house in case it was bugged or what have you. But he went through things that happened in the house that evening. Because of me asking him, I didn't want to rely on my gut feeling. I needed to ask him more. During her summer holidays at Jeremy's flat in 1984, Miss Mugford said he began to talk about getting rid of all his family. He said his father was getting old, his mother was mad anyway, and it would put her out of her misery. I think Julie Mugford was attracted to their devil-may-care, insouciant, very eloquent, quite handsome, uh, in a very caddish sort of way, uh, almost a swagger to, to the young Jeremy Bamber at 24, until she began to realise that actually this man was something far, far more dangerous and something far more wicked. Julie Mugford's allegations lead to Bamba's arrest, a month after the tragedy. A few days later, he's bailed and immediately goes on holiday to Saint-Tropez. Jeremy Bamba, who's a 24-year-old farmer, was given a police escort from the court to be collected by friends at a nearby police station. When I saw him, all I thought was I just wanted him to tell the truth rather than him telling everyone I was lying. I wanted him to just turn round my biggest wish was he'd just stand up and say, look, just stop it, I, I admit it. On his return to England, police re-arrest him and he's charged with the murders. Jeremy Bamber was found guilty of family annihilation on the 28th of October, 1986. Jeremy Bamber stood absolutely impassive in the dock as the foreman of the jury replied guilty five times. On each murder charge, the jury had reached a majority verdict of 10 to 2. Only after the last verdict did he close his eyes and allow his shoulders to slump. But he recovered his composure very quickly and stared the judge straight in the eye. A man who can kill his father and mother, who have adopted him and given him a family, a public school education, given him a job on their farm, Sent, set him up in life, who can kill them, then kill his sister and shoot her two six-year-old twins in bed, is evil beyond belief, surely. Bamba has now been in prison for 30 years and made several appeals against his sentence. All have been unsuccessful. To this day, he still claims his innocence. Stuart Hazel is probably one of the most duplicitous and barbaric sex offenders the UK has seen in recent years. His killing of Tia Sharp in August 2013 devastated her family and had a massive impact on their community. The person that you think is that stranger tends to be the person that's on the street, you know, that danger element. But the reality was this is a person that was living amongst them. We find it incredible to believe that someone within our own family would have the potential to murder one amongst us. The sad thing about this case is that although it's not his grandchild, she knew him from the age of two as granddad and she adored him and he allegedly adored her. Hazel wasn't unknown to the police. He had previous convictions and had served three stretches inside. 
He had a long history of, of criminal convictions ranging right the way back to when he was an adolescent. So he was involved from an early age in a lot of petty crime, acquisitive crime robberies, burglaries, um, he would take cocaine, he dealt in cocaine. But was he destined to become a child killer? Hazel was somebody who'd had an incredibly dysfunctional upbringing. His mother was a prostitute, his father wasn't around, he was in prison. And we know that he spent quite a lot of time in the care system. Hazel's childhood was difficult and he may have been subjected to sexual abuse himself. He was exposed to sexual behaviour from an early age. He claims to have been raped at 16. So we've got a guy who's got a very mixed up, screwed up family. That's a huge trauma that would have added psychological impact to him. Um, in terms of whether those, that background would create somebody who would go on to kill, not necessarily, because there's lots of people who grow up in childhoods like that, unfortunately, and go on to have very difficult lives, but don't go on to kill. For many years, while living with Tia's grandmother, Christine, Hazel hid his true self behind a mask, that of a loving partner and caring step-grandfather. He couldn't have loved me in the first place. How do you love someone and do that? He knew she was my life, all my grandkids, but she was the eldest, she was my life. You don't take the life from someone you love, surely. For Tia's mother and Christine to discover that the man that they had brought into Tia's life, somebody that they trusted to be around her, somebody they fully believed loved her, to know that he was responsible, firstly for her murder and secondly for their pain, would have blown to pieces their sense of life. They'd not only lost their little girl, but were betrayed by one of their own family members. Tia adored Stuart, he was her grandfather. They would go out on days out together. They would play the PlayStation together. She, she trusted him, she loved him. He was part of her family. And up until the time of the murder, his actions towards Tia had been very good. The betrayal when she found the truth must have been doubly hard to take and to understand that Hazel, who'd been her rock, who was supporting her through this loss, actually was the one who'd killed Tia, must have been absolutely overwhelming for her. Christine and Hazel met 10 years earlier in a pub where she worked. In 2007, he moved into her flat in New Addington, London. Christine was aware of his criminal past, but gave him a chance to start a new chapter. He was a gentle giant. I mean, regardless of his reputation and whatever, all right, he'd get argumentative, but nothing, normal everyday arguments, mm. but no, no violence, no, no abuse. I liked him, we, we, we chatted, we were friends. I, I, I worked in a pub, he drank in. She saw him as an individual who was broken, who hadn't been given the correct love and attention, and essentially she connected very, very quickly with him and fell hard for that relationship, and he did for her. He came into Tia's life when she was about the age two, so she's known nobody else. And she had a granddad. It was never the step granddad. It was he was known as granddad. She loved him unconditionally. I thought he loved her unconditionally as well. Although Tia lived with her mom Natalie, she often visited Christine and Hazel. As a, as a twelve-year-old girl, she was a replica of Natalie. Mouth, attitude. Stomping, storming, slamming, banging. She was not. She was a normal kid. Tia was known as a very feisty, outgoing, confident, fun-loving, smiley girl. Her family talked about her lighting up a room when she walked in. Tia would have sleepovers at Christine's house, even when Christine was out at work. He was family. This time wasn't meant to be any different. Natalie received a text from Hazel, inviting Tia to stay over the weekend. If only she hadn't allowed Tia to go round that night. If only that she had noticed something. If only that she hadn't read those text messages where he said, can Tia come round? So the mum and the grandmum were quite relaxed about it, quite in order for her to stay with the granddad. Nobody suspected anything. Natalie had no idea that by agreeing to a sleepover, it would be the last time she saw her daughter. 
Tia says goodbye to her mother. She meets up with her grandfather and they go off shopping. They come home, Christine rings up. He says everything's fine. Christine can hear her granddaughter in the background laughing and joking and obviously they're, they're getting on extremely well. Everything's fine. When Christine comes back from work the next day, Stuart tells her that Tia is out buying shoes in Croydon. When it comes around six o'clock, they start to get worried because she should be home. You don't take all day, do a little bit of shopping. They get worried, they start phoning, they're not getting any response on the phones. And then, later on in the evening, they go to the police to report her missing. He told the police that she'd gone to Croydon. He seemed to be complying with every request that officers made. He was very open with the media. That's not the behaviour we'd expect from somebody who'd have something to hide. The police start their investigation. They discover the CCTV footage of Tia happily shopping with Hazel. We see on CCTV them acting as normal. There's no indication in his behaviour. He's not mauling her, he's not pouring her, he's not doing anything inappropriate. Police look into Hazel's past and start to have doubts about his story. They search the house a couple of times but find nothing. Tia's disappearance is inexplicable. At a very similar age to Tia, my eldest son went missing for two hours. It was, still is, the worst two hours of my life. Uh, I cannot imagine how it must feel for this family after more than five days. We have used specialist search dogs and the air support unit to search both houses and open ground, and we have searched a large amount of premises within a 500 metre radius of Tia's grandfather's house, including garages, lock-ups, all public access areas, the local school and wooded areas. A few days after Tia's disappearance, Hazel invites the media to his home to make a TV appeal, in the same house where he's hidden her body. This is all about Tia, and we've got to get her home, man. We've got to get her home. When asked if he'd done anything, Hazel protests his innocence. I'd love to sit there, and they ask me stupid questions yesterday, like, oh, did you do anything to Tia? Well, no, I bloody didn't. Excuse my language, but no, I didn't. I'd never think of that. I'd love to, it's a bit, she's like my own daughter for God's sake, we had that sort of relationship, it was that sort of thing. When you look at the footage subsequently of Hazel, many people have said they can tell he was lying. I'm sure that those tears were genuine, only they were probably tears of remorse rather than tears of worry and panic for where she may be. So he misguidedly believes that by opening himself up, inviting the press even into the home that he, Tia was in when she disappeared, he's going to appear not guilty. He just needs to convince everybody else and Christine that he's innocent. Well, if they believe what they read in the papers, they can do whatever they like, because I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. She walked out of there, and I know damn well because she was seen walking down the pathway. I know she made that track down to that way. What happened after that is I don't know. He's an individual who's learned that lying can sometimes get you out of a situation. Lying can be a very effective solution to a problem. And the longer he kept that lie going through countless police searches and interviews with the media, it is possible that he genuinely thought at some point he could get away with it. To the rest of the family, Stuart Hazel was nothing short of supportive and concerned. They couldn't see what was in front of them. At no point did Tia's family believe that he could potentially or possibly have been involved in her disappearance. They fully believed him. When we went on searches, he was there. We was in the house, he was there. He didn't do anything out of the ordinary. A few days after Tia's disappearance, Hazel goes on the run. His departure coincides with Christine noticing a bad smell in the house that she can't quite locate. Christine, uh, about a week later, is complaining bitterly about the smell in the house. And she's reported going around the house, checking whether there's any rotten food or anything rotten in the, in the, in the house. The police had also searched the family a number of times. They'd searched the house and the garden. And it was only on the fourth 
search of the house did they find Tia's body hidden, wrapped away. When I first got told that they'd, they'd found a body in the loft, I actually asked who it was. I, that wasn't her. No, that wasn't her. Stuart Hazel is soon arrested, spotted buying alcohol in a shop. Hazel was formally charged by detectives late last night, some 24 hours after his arrest. But what exactly happened to Tia the night he was with her, nobody knows. Hazel has never revealed what he did to his step-granddaughter. We can see from his behaviour leading up to the murder what his motivations were, and his motivations were very simply sexual. He was looking at pornography involving children. He was looking at pornography where the young girls looked like Tia. There was one very sinister uh, piece of evidence where he was videoing her while she was asleep and then he cut to the shadow on the wall. That, that was exciting him, that he was there preying on Tia. Perhaps while he was suggesting things to her, that things got out of hand. Perhaps she was going to tell the police or tell her grandmother what had happened, and he may have panicked and smothered her or strangled her without thinking it through. Stuart Hazel murders Tia, but his evil cruelty doesn't stop there. When he was charged, he protested his innocence right up until into his, his initial trial proceedings began when he confessed that actually he had killed Tia. They'd already sat through most of the evidence. They'd already sat through having to look at that horrific photograph of Tia's body. The jury had to look at that. Nobody will ever be able to get that image out of their head. He put them through that agony for five days and then he decided to admit his guilt. December 1998, in Southport, Merseyside. It's the magical time in the run-up to Christmas. No different to any other year. But in the Kwai family, the atmosphere is not so festive. Lindsay and Kwai were a very young couple. And they connected, and they connected quite passionately. Their relationship was stormy, to say the least. They had very intense feelings towards each other, but that could be love, and it could equally be hate, and then back to love. Lindsay was only 17 years old when she met 20-year-old Mitchell. At the time, she was already heavily pregnant with a former boyfriend's baby. They were only going out together for about six weeks. They decided to get married, and uh, they just did it. I suspect her reasons for marrying was because she was pregnant. Um, this chap coming along, very smooth, very talkative, very sociable. She probably thought it would make the best of a bad job. Da, 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 da. I thought he was a nice bloke and he was going to look after her. I thought she'd be happy. It wasn't that long after we married we started arguing. We were dead stubborn, so if we were arguing, ne neither of us had backed down, so... There's trouble virtually every week, you know what I mean? We stopped going round. You weren't wanted anyway. He didn't want you there. He was just fond of getting the gyro, taking it, and going off for days on end. Very quickly, their relationship became abusive. There was violence enacted against Lindsay on their wedding night. Mitchell was a typical coercive control domestic abuse perpetrator. Despite the tempestuous nature of the relationship, the couple had always got back together and eventually had a child of their own. She was caught in this trap that she'd been separated from her family by him because he was controlling her. He goes and leaves. She's left alone with two young children. She's lonely, she's not able to cope with the children. So she took him back and then he would leave again, and then she'd take him back and leave again. So it's a very, very disturbing relationship for her. By December 1998, the couple had split many times. But Lindsay wants to give it another go, 
and sets about organizing a memorable Christmas for her children. On the 13th of December, she meets up with her mother. She was all excited. She asked me how to get any spare um, baubles and tinsel and stuff for the tree. I took her home and we got to Berry Road Corner Shop and she went in to get me some cigarettes. She says, uh, right, I'm going now. I said, well, get back in, I'll drop you off. She said, no, it's all right. She leaned in the car and she hugged me and kissed me and said, bye, Mum. I've never seen her again. On Christmas Eve, Mitchell comes over to Lindsay's parents to pick up gifts for the children. When the mum asks where Lindsay is, he tells her that um, she's getting ready for a night out and that she's a psycho and she's shagging somebody else. Christmas passes and nobody hears anything from Lindsay. Most men, if the wife's not home on Christmas Day, would be saying there's something wrong. And certainly by Boxing Day would be on to the police uh, reporting her missing. It's only the concern of a social worker that raises a red flag. Lindsay is eventually declared missing on February the 5th, 1999. Why did he not tell us? He was so fond of coming down, passing messages in the past, like give these flowers to Lindsay, give this note to Lindsay. So why didn't he tell anybody? Lindsay's family, I was, they're the last people I'd contact. Why would I contact Lindsay's family? Lindsay's family, I have not, I, well, we just don't like each other. He suggests that she's gone off, she's left him for somebody else. Now, her mother knows her daughter. She knows that's not how Lindsay would respond. She knows that Lindsay's absolutely committed and devoted to her children. So that starts to ring alarm bells. His behaviour certainly indicates psychopathic uh, tendencies, to say the least. He mimics emotions rather than actually experience emotions. Added to that, he was a very narcissistic character. He wanted all the attention. He wanted the sympathy. So he's quite a, quite a disturbed character in many ways. But he's not mentally ill. He knew what he was doing. I said, she's not missing, she's dead. He's done something, and my dad said, I know that. She got ready, got up, got dressed, and then she went out. She just left us. Well, we knew it couldn't be true. She wouldn't do that. Police, family, and friends were convinced that Kwai was responsible for Lindsay's disappearance. Her family when she was reported missing, straight away knew something was wrong. They knew that she would never, ever walk out on her children. It doesn't bother me, people would think what they want. I know, you know, I know what's happened. I can't help the fact she left at Christmas. I wouldn't leave my kids at Christmas. No one would leave the kids at Christmas, but I can't help what happened. Um, she did leave. Nobody apart from Mitchell claims to have laid eyes on her since before Christmas. There's no evidence or body found. Cold and heartless, without a hint of guilt or remorse, was how the police felt about Mitchell Coy while they searched for his wife. Are you ready? Come on, Joe. I think she's been murdered. I don't think we'll ever see her again. Lindsay's family found that her absence was causing huge questions. They felt fundamentally sure that she was dead. And that's such a difficult position to be in. To fear for your child's life, to believe that the worst outcome is possible and probable. And at the same time, to be watching this man who potentially ended their daughter's life, weaving a huge web of lies. There was something deeply wrong in the roots of their relationship. One of the fundamental changing factors in Kwai and Lindsay's relationship comes down to the abortion she decided to have a year after they get together and are married. She asserts control, number one, abusers don't like that. But secondly, she destroys a part of him that he has no control over. The psyche of somebody who's got those psychopathic tendencies, it's not going to be an acceptable state of affairs. I don't know, I mean, I hated her for it. I mean, the way I saw her at the time, I suppose, is like, take on a child that isn't mine, and then you kill one of my kids. I mean, 
I don't know, sickened me, really did, absolutely sickened me. Could this have pushed Mitchell to kill Lindsay? Yeah, it gives me motive, and I can understand being a suspect, but I, I'm not going to stand here and protest my innocence with anyone because I don't need to. In an extraordinarily brazen act, knowing he's a prime suspect, Kwai invites the media to his home to film a documentary in order to convince police and the local community of his innocence. I've been publicly branded. Might as well have murderer wrote across my forehead. Some of the comments that he makes to the TV crew that he invites into his home are beyond shocking. They show a complete lack of remorse and they show certainly um, elements of narcissistic personality traits. I'm not a psychopath. Do I look like a psychopath? But what does a psychopath look like? I mean, that's the thing you've got to ask yourself. He loved all the attention. He liked to be in the limelight, going on television, sitting there saying... Husbands do kill their wives. Husbands do kill their wives, but I didn't. Made up with that, absolutely. It's even more distressing yeah. to gets my uh, message across. That's my mummy. The police investigation was about to take a rapid turn with the appointment of the new senior investigating officer, Jeff Sloan. My tactic was that I was never ever going to meet Mitchell. I wasn't going to play his game. And I'd let it be known to him through a third party that the only time I would see Mitchell Kwai is when he was arrested and he was going to be charged for murder. He kept making himself so obnoxious to the police and bring so much attention to himself because of his narcissistic personality that he became a suspect uh, simply by his behaviour. He was really angry that I decided to classify the case as a murder inquiry, even more angry that I'd classified him as the prime suspect. Fire. I hate the fellow, I've never even met him. The unhappy husband again uses the press to present his side of the story. A lot of people in Southport believed he hadn't done anything and thought he was great the way he was looking after the children and going into the papers all the time saying he was innocent, he wanted to find his wife. We all knew at the time, every word of it was a lie. Kwai believed that he was smarter than everybody else and that without a body, police couldn't prove anything. He's engaging with a game. He believes that if he convinces the general public, the general population, that he's the good guy, that she's the villain, then somehow he can change reality. Yeah, so Jeff Sloan's actually in this station today then. The fact that he makes calls to the police on camera, these are all behaviours we would not expect to see. Am I, am I, still, am I still under suspicion of murder? I mean, is, is, am, I, am I still a suspect in this murder inquiry? It very much shows a narcissistic side to him, a completely egotistical, a uh, man who was enjoying the intention and enjoying playing the victim. Finally, crucial evidence comes through that proves Lindsay had gone missing before Christmas. She had an appointment with a solicitor quite clearly to discuss divorce. That was on the 15th, and there's no evidence that um, says that she was seen between about the 16th and the 24th of December. When Kwai was pushed by reporters to answer the murder accusation, he completely refused. Did you kill Lindsay? Wait and find out. Just wait and find out. 18 months after Lindsay's disappearance, Mitchell Kwai is finally arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. Only then did he tell police where they would find her dismembered body close to a roller coaster site in the seaside town. His wife had told him at Christmas 1998 she wanted a divorce. His response was to kill and butcher her. Traumatic loss is always the most difficult grief process. But for her family to know that not only was she murdered, she then had her body cut into pieces. She was treated like pieces of meat. Psychologically, that's almost impossible to comprehend.